growing up, I missed the whole Doom Wolfenstein craze of the early 90s. In fact, the Nintendo 64 was the system that introduced me to the genre. As my 16-bit days of gaming consisted of every other kind of genre but shooters. Even if I could have afforded Doom on the Super Nintendo, I probably would have spent my money on something else because my gaming tastes were different. Somehow, by saving birthday money, lunch money, and from my older brother having a job at the time, we managed to buy a Nintendo 64 in the summer of 97. And by September, we also managed to buy a PlayStation, a system we bought because of Final Fantasy VII. So in 1997, we rushed ahead into the next generation. I said in my previous spotlight PS1 first person shooters video that for the longest time I believed that the only two shooters worth talking about on the PS1 were Medal of Honor and Medal of Honor Underground. And another part of the reason I held that view is because owning both systems at the time, the N64 was my go-to system for first person shooters, whereas the PS1 was my go-to system for almost every other kind of genre in my gaming tastes at the time. I did not play 3D platformers at the time, so almost everything else went to the PS1. By and large, I have fond memories of playing most of the games I am going to list. I did not own most of them at the time, but I rented the crap out of them. Going through this list, I remembered how many quality offerings the system has to offer in this genre. As with my PS1 video previously, I am only going to be showcasing shooters from my own personal collection, so this won't be covering every single shooter on the system. Unless someone brings another one to my attention, I would say the biggest omission on this list is the original Quake, which I own on the PC and Saturn, but not on the N64. Other than that, no Dai Katana and no Rainbow Six. Also, I know you can play games like Shadows of the Empire in first person view, but Shadows will always be a third person shooter slash everything else thrown in for good measure game to me, and not a first person shooter. And with all of that said, here is a rundown of first person shooter games that I own for the Nintendo 64. Double O Seven. The world is not enough. Look at a list of the best Bond games released since GoldenEye, and there will usually be one thing in common with all of them. They're more than likely all developed by Eurocom, and The World is Not Enough is where it all started. While I personally still prefer GoldenEye over this game, mostly due to the feeling of the gunplay, there are some people out there who, indeed, like this game over Rare's Goliath, and I can understand why. While I can't go into every detail, one of the biggest pros is that it definitely gets the Bond feel down better than Goldeneye did, especially with the heavier emphasis on the use of gadgets. The core design still copies the foundation first seen in Goldeneye, objective-based missions with tons of bad guys to dispatch. The mechanics are the same in the controls and the auto-aiming of weapons. The game duplicates GoldenEye's gameplay masterfully, while still managing to create its own feel. Even the gunplay is done really well, but I cannot put my finger on what exactly, but GoldenEye's feels a little better. Maybe it's the speed of it, I can't really say. That being said, this is still easily one of the best shooters on the Nintendo 64. And it even adds bots in the multiplayer for good measure. Oh! Armorines Project Swarm As I said in my Spotlight PS1 first-person shooters video, even for its time, Armorines was 
an average at best first person shooter. That being said, I do remember the reviews for this game being awful, and while I haven't played it all the way through, I can already tell you that this is better than the reviews made it out to be. This is not the best shooter you will find on the Nintendo 64, but it certainly isn't the worst either. The N64 version is probably the better buy over the PS1 version, even if it feels a little more sluggish than the PS1 version, even with an expansion pack and running it in low res mode. And the designers, for whatever reason, forgot about the play mechanic where firing off your last round makes your character automatically reload for you? You have to do it manually every time. Small complaint, though. There's also a co-op campaign mode, so you can actually play through the single player with a friend. Which is a nice touch and always a great option to have. Doom 64 This was my introduction to Doom. Having never owned a PC growing up, I never had the chance to experience the original. PCs were neither cheap, nor as commonplace as they are today, and very few people I knew ever owned one. So having never played the original Doom, Doom 64 is the game I referenced in my mind every time the subject of Doom came up. This darker feeling moody Doom game with redone character sprites, fully polygonal graphics, and an ambient soundtrack is what I truly thought Doom was all about. It is strange to say looking back now, but I had no internet and no magazine subscriptions at the time of its release, so I did not find out the truth about this game for many years. That being said, this, for its time, completely new Doom game, made from the ground up, all new graphics, all new levels, and same great Doom feel, is a great addition to the Doom series and a great addition to your Nintendo 64 first-person shooter library. Duke Nukem 64 While Duke Purist panned the N64 port for having the raunchiest bits of the game censored, which, in hindsight, as gaming has already long since passed the F-bomb and nudity lines, is a small complaint. Yes, some of the raunchy bits add to the cheesy action character theme of the game. Even without the shock value, you are still left with an exceptionally designed first-person shooter. Do you really think that Duke is only popular because of its shock value? What this port of Duke loses in censorship, it makes up for with some thoughtful additions. The graphics have been completely revamped, Better looking areas, better looking explosions, redone smoother looking weapons and enemy sprites, and a smooth frame rate. Some level layouts have been altered, and there are even new secret areas to find in some of them. And there are some cool multiplayer additions, like being able to play the campaign co-op with a friend, and a deathmatch mode that even lets you fight against bots. I only have two small complaints against this port. The first is that the default controller setup forces you to use the D-pad to swap out weapons, which requires you to move one hand off the controller in order to change weapons. That being said, I haven't played around with the control setups, so scratch that complaint if just swapping the controller layout in one of the options remedies that one. My biggest complaint of all is... What happened to the music? That's right, upon booting the game up, you are treated to an awesome rendition of the Duke Nukem theme. But that's where the music begins and ends in this game. All the levels are silent, hearing only Duke and the enemies. Small annoyance though for what is still a great shooter to add to your Nintendo 64 library. GoldenEye 007 if you own an N64, you obviously do not need to be told about this one. I have so many great memories of playing this one multiplayer against my brother and another friend. 
we could never find a fourth player as we got so good and so cutthroat at this game, no one wanted to play against us. There is so much I could go into about Goldeneye, but this is one of those games that so many people have so many great memories playing as well. Even though I can admit that it probably was a little overrated in hindsight, I still love this game and have fond memories of playing it. Parts of the game may feel dated, mostly the control scheme and the botless multiplayer, meaning, in my opinion, you need at least three people playing to make it fun, because one-on-one -on -one bores me in multiplayer. But the single player and the feel of the game are still really fun to this day. I think part of it is that you can tell that Rare had a lot of fun making this game. It's a serious game that doesn't take itself too seriously. For starters, everything in the game blows up when shot. Shoot a chair, shoot a desk, it doesn't matter, everything blows up. The enemies also have such a goofy and awkward charm to them. You almost feel bad for killing them. Well, almost, as they certainly don't have the same problem with killing you, especially on the harder difficulties. They don't say anything. This is akin to killing a bunch of mimes. But they still have tons of character in their animation. Even their death animations are goofy. Is there any wonder that members of the GoldenEye team went on to make the also very goofy and very humorous Time Splitters series, which also has serious gameplay behind the goofiness. Humor aside, the game has some serious gameplay. Previous shooters on other consoles did have multiplayer through System Link, but GoldenEye showed off the power of the N64 by setting the standard for split-screen multiplayer being as much of a must in its day as online deathmatches currently. As I mentioned earlier, the gunplay is thrilling, and other hardcore additions, like the ability to unlock new cheats by completing each level on a certain difficulty within a certain time limit, turning every level in the game into its own challenge mode, and adding a ton of replay value. There is no cheat menu in this game, no codes. You have to earn your cheats, which you can then use in the multiplayer. I can go on and on about this game. Even if you are not a fan of this game, you still have to admit that GoldenEye has left its mark on gaming. And in my opinion, it's still a timeless classic. Hexen. I guess that Hexen does sort of qualify as a first-person shooter. It does have certain RPG elements, but Ultima Underworld, this ain't. Hexen is part of the Heretic series, which means little to me as Hexen is the only game in the series I have played. I remember renting Hexen for the Nintendo 64 back in the day and hating it. I remember thinking it was kind of cool that my brother and I could play co-op, in fact, up to four players can, which is pretty cool, actually. There's also a deathmatch mode for kicks. For the longest time, if you asked me, I would tell you that this is an awful game. I saw little value in it for the longest time. However, years of hearing its fans defend it and realizing that I certainly did not play it enough to give it a fair shot back in the 90s has caused me to acquire it myself. I've had it for years and still haven't played it much since I got it. In playing this footage, this is probably the furthest I've gotten in the game since I rented it 19 to 20 years ago. And sure enough, it clicked this time. And I actually enjoyed what I played. It might be another decade before I ever play it again. But now I see the appeal and why people like it. This will never be my favorite shooter-slash-RPG hybrid, but it definitely has its appeal. I can't recommend this to every N64 owner, but more for those with open minds and who are more forgiving in their gaming. Perfect Dark I probably don't have to tell anyone about this game. 
Rare did a bang-up job in following up GoldenEye with a game that improved on the formula in almost every way. After GoldenEye, EA acquired the rights to the James Bond license, leaving Rare to start a completely original IP as the true sequel. The end product was the ever-delayed Perfect Dark. If you were stuck on a desert island with only an N64 to play, this is definitely a game you want to have on that island. It has so many modes of play, and thanks to the bot multiplayer, almost endless replay value. The graphics, thanks to the expansion pack, are high res. The single player mode now supports a storyline as well as voiceover work. It even allows for two player co op. Bots have been added to the multiplayer, meaning that even if you have no one else to play with, you can still enjoy the multiplayer. All kinds of challenge modes have been added. Even the firing range at the Carrington Institute has its own challenge modes. And overall, Rare went out of their way to improve over Goldeneye in every way. I only really have two small complaints about this game. The biggest is the addition of an incredibly annoying blur effect whenever you get hit. This is especially annoying in multiplayer, because not only does it lead to the computer opponent slapping you to death as your entire screen turns into a blurred mess of annoyance, but not even dying clears this effect from your screen. You respawn with a screen that is just as blurry as when you died, and you have to wait until it clears on its own. I know this seems like a nitpick on what is otherwise an exemplary game, but it sometimes ruins the experience in multiplayer for me. My other small complaint is, well, not really a complaint, but just the fact that even with so many improvements over GoldenEye, I still like GoldenEye better. For me, it will always be the more memorable of the two games. Every level in GoldenEye is a lot more memorable than the ones in Perfect Dark. In order to remember a level in Perfect Dark, I generally have to play it again, whereas I can remember most of the levels in GoldenEye off the top of my head. This could be chalked up to the different stage of life I was in at the time Perfect Dark released, or maybe the vastly different gaming climate in the year 2000 when Perfect Dark hit, versus the one in 1997 when GoldenEye hit. I don't fully remember when I picked this game up. I do remember that it was when it was dropped down to a $10 price tag, and I bought it with Donkey Kong Country because that game came with the expansion pack. So when I bought this game, I either already owned a Sega Dreamcast or was very close to owning one. Meaning, though Perfect Dark was a great game and a great showing for the Nintendo 64, and I did end up putting many hours into it. Between being hyped for the PS2, owning a Dreamcast, as well as collecting for the PS1, my gaming focus had shifted away from the Nintendo 64. I had also moved away from my hometown and ended up moving again after a year to another new high school in Arizona, meaning that by the time I had made friends that were trustworthy enough to come over and play games, we were already playing PS2, Xbox, and GameCube games, and any itching we had for bot deathmatches went to time splitters. So for me, GoldenEye will always be keen, even if objectively Perfect Dark is the better of the two. I just spent more time with GoldenEye and have better memories of playing it. However, if you own a Nintendo 64, this game needs to be in your collection. I don't even know if it's debatable. If this is your favorite Nintendo 64 game, or even possibly your favorite game of all time, you did well, because this is still a great game and still a classic, and it should be in your collection if you own a Nintendo 64. <laughs> <laughs> Quake 2! Like Doom 64, this was the only version of Quake 2 I had played 
or eventually owned for the longest time. And like Doom 64, I had no idea until much later on that this version of Quake 2 was a completely different version of the game. I didn't even own a copy of the PC version until 2005, and not even the gaming magazines at the time bothered to mention the fact that the N64 version of Quake 2 was a completely different game from the PC original. So I just figured that Quake 2 had ambient music in the backgrounds and straightforward sequential levels. I rented the original Quake for the N64 previously, so I figured Quake 2 used the same moody style soundtrack. Boy, was I wrong about that one. The N64 version of Quake 2 would probably be more like a mission pack for the PC version, and scores points for being a completely different game. All the levels are new and different from the PC version. There is no hub level setup where each level felt like one giant seamless level with different areas to explore in the PC version. And the rocking Sonic Mayhem soundtrack has been replaced with ambient music. The N64 version still has all the baddies and the hard hitting beefy weapons, minus the throwing grenades but who misses those, of the PC version. While, obviously, the speed of shifting from a mouse setup to an analog stick has slowed the game down quite a bit. The game still has its own sense of intensity. And there is always something so satisfying about blasting an enemy in the face with the Quake 2 Super Shotgun. My favorite shotgun in all of gaming. This is a well-designed, well-made, great shooter that is a great addition to any shooter fan's library. There's even a solid deathmatch in this one for up to four players, but no bots to frag. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> Two Rock Dinosaur Hunter. This was actually my introduction to first person shooters. This is the first one I ever played. Looking back, I remember this game seeming very disorienting. I never got motion sickness from games, but being new to 3D gaming and having Turok as one of the first polygonal games I played, this game, at the time, seemed a lot more magical and mystical to me. There was something surreal about playing this game, and I still really like it. In hindsight, there are issues that may turn some gamers off to this game. I liken it to platformer elements added to the design. The biggest one being that in order to unlock new levels in the game, you have to find level keys hidden throughout each of the massive levels in the game. Many of them are obvious and easy to find, but others require exploring every inch of each level to find hidden areas. Turok does have a very good map function, but this means that the reward for beating a level is not always going to the next level in the game. If you miss some of the keys hidden throughout the map, you have to backtrack to search every inch of the previous level in order to find them. Basically, if you don't get them all on your first try, you will be replaying many of the levels multiple times. Luckily, there is a list in the menu of all the keys on each level so you can find out how many you still need to find. The levels are huge, and replaying many of them can lead to frustration, especially the ones that require a lot of platform jumping. And that is another thing that may turn many gamers off. There is a ton of platform jumping in Turok. Many of the jumping sequences can be annoying when you miss the jump and have to constantly climb back up to the beginning to start the platform sequence again. This sometimes feels like trial and error, but in other places it is do or die, meaning that missing the platform treats you to a quick cutscene of Turok plummeting to his death and using up a life. That is another platformer-esque design choice that will seem out of place. 
while there are mid-level save points, Turok gains lives by collecting a hundred of these triangle things. I'm not sure if I've just forgotten their official name or if I never knew their name to begin with, so triangle things. When you collect 100, Turok usually announces the fact that you just gained an extra life by proclaiming I am Turok, and generally scaring the ever-living crap out of you in the process. When you run out of lives, it is game over and there is no continuing. I guess you could consider the live system as a retry system where you get to start back right where you left off without loading your game, but even then it does seem strange to be in a first person shooter. All that being said, I still love this game. I have never actually beaten it by playing straight through, but that's because it's one of those games where the cheat codes were just so much fun to play around with that I spent more time playing the game with cheats over the years than I have trying to play it in a serious manner. Playing around in the game can be just as fun as playing it seriously, which adds a new dimension of fun to this game. Overall, despite some awkward design choices that may turn some gamers off, this is still a worthy title for first-person shooter fans. And it has impeccable atmosphere. And yes, a lot of fog too. <laughs> Turok 2, Seeds of Evil. If I remember correctly, the developers of this game were quoted as saying that every level in Turok 2 is the equivalent of walking six virtual miles. Turok 2 improved over the original in many ways. Better graphics thanks to the expansion pack, bigger levels, an actual storyline split-screen multiplayer, and cooler weapons like the Cerebral Boar. To be perfectly honest, I still have yet to fully play through Turok 2 either. Not only have I had just as much fun playing around with the cheats as I did in the original, there is also one incredibly demotivating design choice that has always kept me from fully playing this game. I don't even remember how far I have played into it over the years, as I tend to delete my save in order to make room on my N64 memory card for other games. What has kept me from being motivated from seeing this one all the way through is simply that in each level, Adon starts out by giving you level objectives you have to complete. Taking a cue from Goldeneye, Turok 2 switched to objective-based missions. What demotivates me every time I decide, this time I'm going to do it, I will see it through this time, is the simple fact that if you miss one of these objectives in the level, you get knocked right back to the beginning of the level and have to start again. The objectives you have already completed are still completed, but you have to retread in order to find, say, one missing child you did not rescue. My only other slight quip about this game is that while the game does look great running in high-res mode and even high-res letterbox mode thanks to the expansion pack, if you want it to be playable and not sluggish, you still pretty much have to play this game in low-res mode as high-res mode makes the game chug. The fog doesn't bother me as much as it bothers others, though. I don't mean to sound overly critical, because I still really like this game and do suggest it to all N64 first-person gamers. Just be warned, there are some frustrating design choices. That being said, I am totally going to see this game through one of these days! Turok 3 Shadows of Oblivion 
One of the last big shooter releases for the N64, Turok 3 definitely has a Half-Life inspired single player mode. And in my probably unpopular opinion, has the best single player in the original Turok series. I've actually played through this game all the way, but it has been years and I only vaguely remember it. The only complaint I remember having is that the weapons in the game did not feel as though they had as much oomph to them as in previous games. The opening sequence in the single player sees the current Turok, Joshua, dying and thus leaving the role of Turok open for two new characters to fill. The player can choose to play the game as either Danielle or Joseph. Danielle is capable of jumping higher and can reach different paths in each level that Joseph cannot. However, Joseph is smaller and can slip into smaller areas that Danielle cannot. This gives the player incentive to play through the game twice, once with each character, in order to see all that the game has to offer. Thanks to their work on the previous Turok Rage Wars, the multiplayer is now much improved with the addition of bots. These bots aren't as smart as those found in Perfect Dark, and they still have a tendency to team up on you, even when teams are turned off. But it is still a nice addition to the game. Overall, I would have to say that this is my favorite Turok on the N64, and it's different enough from the previous games that even if you could not get into the original or Turok 2, Turok 3 is still worth a look. And hey, you can actually play this one in high-res mode, as it doesn't go into slug mode when you do. Turok Rage Wars 1999 was the year of the tournament shooter. Id Software and Epic Mega Games released two huge bombs on PC gamers that year, known as Quake 3 and Unreal Tournament. Rage Wars follows suit by asking the same simple question. Who needs a single player mode? Like Quake 3 and Unreal Tournament. What consists of a single-player campaign in Rage is just a series of bot matches with multiplayer objectives added. Multiplayer arenas have replaced large, intricately designed levels, and there is no story to speak of. After every few levels, you get a boss level, but in the end, the single-player mode is just training for the multiplayer mode, and the only reason to bother with it is because playing it unlocks things in multiplayer. Overall, I really enjoy this game. It's like Unreal Tournament for N64 gamers, and if you didn't have a PC at the time, this would be a great buy to try and fill that multiplayer-only gap. I do, however, have one really big caution for this game. The single-player mode allows for co-op play with a friend. However, if you own the black cartridge version of this game, you will never be able to complete the game with two-player co-op. There is a glitch in the black cartridge version in one of the monkey tag modes that no matter what you do, you will always lose the match. This is a game-ending glitch. Luckily, Acclaim later released a gray version of the cart where this glitch is fixed, so if you were buying this game off of Amazon or eBay, make sure you buy the gray version of the cartridge. I am Torok. <laughs>